Hello and welcome to Building the Premier Accounting Firm. This is a podcast dedicated to helping accounting professionals start and build their own successful accounting business, offering quality accounting services and getting paid what they're worth. This will actually cover as topics a variety of things that you would be needing to know as the owner of an accounting business to ensure that you're actually providing quality accounting services and getting paid what you're worth. In fact, having the premier accounting firm in your area. We cover a variety of topics each week, ranging from marketing and selling to offering quality accounting services to your clients, things ranging from pricing, staff training, onboarding clients, client retention, and so much more. So I encourage you to listen and join us for each of our weekly podcasts as we speak to the experts and find out what it is they suggest we do as we run our businesses. Now, today I have an an amazing guest. It happens to be Shane Lucas. Shane happens to be a business coach and a TEDx speaker and strategist. His business is AVN. He helps inspire accountants and provides accountants in practice the skills, training, and resources to build better firms and to better service their business clients by providing powerful business growth solutions over and above producing accounts. Now, uh, one of the things that I want to emphasize is he enables these accountants and their clients to improve their businesses and achieve a better life as a result. Now, Shane has authored many international best-selling books for business owners and accountants and regularly delivers talks on leadership and business growth solutions. And his books include two best-selling books for accountants. One is called Putting Excellence into Your Practice. It's a proven roadmap to profitability, sustainability, and value-driven accountancy and business services. And the other is what's next for accountants, how to address the biggest threat facing the profession and get your biggest opportunity out of it. So with that, Shane, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Roger. And well done for saying all of that. (laughs) (laughs) It is definitely a mouthful, but Shane, I've been looking forward to this conversation for some time now. One of the things that I'm excited to uh, bring up is obviously what we're doing to help the accounting profession. But I wanted to start with something that I'm sure you're more than happy to share. And it's this idea of fear that I know you address. And you bring it up with regards to a parachute, uh, you know, a skydiving experience. Why don't we start with that? Oh, wow. Well, uh, yeah, well, why not? I mean, I, you mentioned my TEDx talk, and, and that was certainly bought into that TEDx talk on fear. I mean, fear is one of the biggest things that prevents people from taking fundamental action to improve their business or their lives in any way, don't they? Yes. And, and for me, yeah, uh, my parachute experience actually triggered an, a, an epiphany for me. It made me realize that actually, you know, we're, we're all faced with different challenges from time to time. Yes, my parachute actually failed on me during my jump. But what really surprised me during that, well, I, I suppose after that session, uh, after I'd landed safely on the ground, having rec- re, you know recovered the situation, was that why didn't I feel fear when that happened? And I realised why, and it was just because of the amount of, you know, the preparation that went into that parachute jump, addressing all of the possible what ifs, and really w- w- with fear. It's the what ifs that scare us, isn't it? It is. Not knowing what we might do if something that we've kind of conjured up in our brains um, will happen. And and that's the case in in many, you know, I've worked with accountants for literally 24 years now. And I know that some of the, the, the basics that we ask them to put in place are very scary for them. Well, you know, what if my what if my clients balk at that? What if I lose all of my clients? And then they start to build this picture in their heads of all the things that might go wrong. And really, they're just a set of what ifs. And when you really break those what ifs down and say, well, actually, what? How how likely is that to happen? Okay, if it did, what would you do about it? How might you handle that? Then actually, that's a great way of just really just putting those what ifs in their place, if you like, and and being prepared for them. So if they do happen, uh, actually, you know, we've got that plan in place. And and that just, it it kind of negates that fear um, that that we build up in our heads as to what might happen. I know, I know there's um, an expression, fear stands for false evidence appearing real. But actually, many of these things are real, they could happen, couldn't they? So yeah, I think it's just being prepared for them. Yeah, there's a few things that come to mind. One, I have a very close friend of mine who had a very similar situation, and he has shared with me on numerous occasions 
that experience and how it felt and the emotions that went involved with it. And I'm eager to go back with him and ask him again some some specific questions about not only the preparation, but the fear that you've brought up. Because I think as accountants, there are a lot of individuals that as they're running their business, they do have realistic fears, as you've described, but too often they don't express them or kind of analyze them or better said, prepare for what those those situations could be to better prepare themselves for then handling the situation and then addressing it as they perhaps could or should. So um, what you're doing here is I think bringing up a very real thing that many accountants have because there's that stereotypical risk aversion that they all have, not all, but stereotypically have, I guess. And what we're trying to do is just say, well, let's address these things that you have as concerns and come up with very plausible, um, uh, let's say, recourses that if anything happens, this is what we're going to do then to address the situation and come out uh, better prepared and better able to deal with whatever's come of it. Like you were talking about changing prices and in turn, maybe having a change happen with the client base that we're serving. So um, here's what I'd like to do is I know you bring up four things that you feel every accountant should be addressing when running their business. And I, I'm going to mention them and I'd like to kind of go through them each because I think you've really hit on some very important points here. One is you talk about increasing profits. Obviously, we're in business to make money less effort. It'd be kind of nice to do it with some time savings, more enjoyment. Uh, it'd be kind of nice to enjoy what we're doing. And then last of all, making a difference, obviously helping our clients. Let's kind of go through each of those four things and talk a little bit about them. And let's begin with the profit. Why is profit so important for us as accounting professionals as we run our businesses? Yeah, it's a great question. And many accountants I speak to might say, do you know what? I'm, I'm, it's not about the money. I'm not driven by money. Um, and you know, a few people are when they reach a certain point in their life, you know, they're, they're covering their basic living. But actually, profits, are, well, you know, uh, uh, the risk of stating the obvious are very important to any business because you you, you want to make more profits that you can maybe invest back into the business that might free up your time more. You can employ um, higher level uh, team members for a start, you know, you can start to uh, to reinvest to grow that business more and allow yourself to step out of it. But of course, you know, profits are also more money in your own bank account. And money on the fact, you know, we, we all grow up with this um, almost stigma sometimes around money. You know, we, we're bought up with expressions like filthy rich uh, and, and those types of expressions, which also they also they almost should I say set a mindset that actually having money is a bad thing, but money is an enabler, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, money can enable us to enjoy our lives more. We can see the world. We you know we we live once and we're on this gigantic playground called planet Earth, and many of us just live in a small bubble, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, in one little corner of it, rather than being able to see it. Uh, so money is an enabler for lots of things. It could be giving more back to the local or wider community. Um, it can be investing in our business. It can be, uh, as I say, just just enjoying our lives more. So, profits, um, yeah, incredibly important for for a number of reasons. And actually, the re reality when I'm speaking to many accountants is that they're barely making a profit. Uh, one of our best case studies, actually, you know, he, he joined us a, a couple of years ago, and he was earning. He got five team members. He was personally earning less than his lowest paid team member. Oh my heavens! And, and working sixty to seventy hours a week, and within nine months, he was earning four times um, what he was previously earning, uh, and and just working a couple of days a week, and and that's how much he mas managed to to turn that situation around. So. Uh, and not only that, it saved his marriage and uh, they're, they're touring the world as a family now much more. Very good. Very good. Now, I like that success story. You know, one of the things that I think is very important about profit is just like when we're working with our clients, it's one of those scorecard elements that we're trying to use because it kind of defines success in many ways. And it is not a four letter word. There's no reason to be concerned or embarrassed about it. And with profit, we can be deliberate and intentional to be profitable. And like you were describing, it allows us to actually have the means to maybe do some other good. And it is a means to an end. And that profit can actually be an enabler for a lot of good things. So 
profit is something that as uh, we're working with our clients, we're going to emphasize, we're going to draw attention to it. We're going to help them see the profit margins and whether or not there's growth in profit. And honestly, the business exists as one of its principal objectives to be profitable. So Mm. at the end of the day, this is something that we should begin with. And I like like how you've listed as the the first on your list of things that you focus on. Uh, Let's talk about less effort now. Uh, What does less effort mean to you? And when you're working with accounting professionals, how do you think they identify with that? Yeah, for me, the the effort is a bit of an all-encompassing because it can be the uh, the hours working, but it can also be the the stress levels, and, and maybe we're yeah. bordering onto the enjoyment here as well. But yeah. um, effort in terms of um, getting the job done, um, looking after a team of people for some people can be high effort. Uh, th- there are many factors involved. Um, when and as I say, it does tie quite closely with enjoyment as well. Uh, um, many of the accountants I, I know um, are workaholics anyway. They they. <laughs> Let me use a different scenario. I hate gardening with a passion, okay? Um, but actually, I have a, um, a an elderly guy come round. He loves gardening, um, and uh, he just enjoys that. And for him, it's effortless. You know, when you're um, when you're doing something that you love, and the transition that we help a lot of accountants make is that they go from something that they see and perceive as high effort. Uh, not excited about getting out of bed in the morning to go and do a you know a day's grunt work to use some of their expressions to actually just bouncing out of bed and just enjoying it. So for some it's working less hours, but ultimately it's about doing stuff that you love. It becomes effortless. You know, I like that you've brought this up because you started with the word workaholic. I can identify with that personally. I love what I do and I spend a lot of time doing it and I'm I'm not adverse to it or trying to find ways necessarily to avoid it. So I do get sucked easily into the routine and the process and quite, in, quite enjoy it, in fact. But the less effort, I think, also equates to this. I'm not going to challenge necessarily the accountant's ability to produce accurate financial reports. The the accuracy of the numbers I'm going to trust is, is there. Mm. What I am going to challenge, though, is the speed in which they're producing those reports that thus impacts their profitability. So if you're taking something that should take you, let's say, two, three hours to do, and you coincidentally are taking 10 hours to do it, I'm going to argue whether or not it's even worthwhile that you offer that service. So what we want to do is just realize that there's a smart, efficient, effective way to do the work and with proper processes, proper procedures, a system in place, you can actually take and streamline these things to be much more effective with your time, still producing the quality report that you do and getting paid for that same production, not based on the hours you worked, but based on what it is you delivered. And the thing that I like about the less effort is there's so many now tools and technologies, software, plugins, apps that actually enable us to work more efficiently internal, uh, in, internally within our office, but also with our clients, that this does not need to be a labor intensive work any longer. And we can find ways to not necessarily shortcut, but work more efficiently. So I like this whole less effort. We don't need the stresses that you were speaking of earlier. Exactly. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Let's talk about more enjoyment. You you tied less effort and enjoyment together a moment ago. What does more enjoyment mean to you? What do you find it it uh, resonates with your clients to mean? I, I haven't met an accountant yet that didn't thoroughly enjoy more of the kind of added value and advisory type of services that we help them to migrate to. Not, not everybody, of course, but many accountants say to me, do you know what, you know, I train to be an accountant, but I don't get much fulfillment from doing the grunt work. You know, uh, sitting back office, crunching the numbers. Uh, yes, uh, you know, once, a, once upon a time, I had a, a passion for dotting the I's and crossing the T's. But actually, what I really enjoy is speaking to the clients and, and sharing with them ways that they can improve their business. And I get a lot more enjoyment, fulfillment, from doing that. So that's really where that comes from. And again, that's closely linked with the making a difference, of course. So um, they're all, of course, tied together very closely, aren't they? They are, they are. Well, the idea of enjoyment, this is this is something I'm sure a lot of our listeners can identify with, is I've met numerous people who will admit that they literally become giddy 
when they can balance the balance sheet or find mm-hmm. the missing pennies that that they're trying to reconcile. I mean, it's it's funny how some of these small little acts can bring such joy, a sense of accomplishment, and uh, they they literally do enjoy the work, and rightfully so, because there's kind of like this this challenge. It's like a, a, a game of Sudoku, and all of a sudden you found the key and you've solved the problem. And that's a good deal of accomplishment. There, There is something that's very satisfying as accounting professionals to have a task and it's completed and you can close the month, for example. That's a huge thing. And it's something that we can be proud of, especially when we're able to now take that information and share a narrative with our clients and help them better understand what's going on in their business through the numbers that we're offering them. So the enjoyment, I definitely find that with many of the clients that I work with simply because accounting at the end of the day can be very fun and very satisfying, very, very gratifying. And I find a lot of accounting professionals find elements of that in their day-to-day work. And that's what's fun. It's it's taking what they love and now doing it for a living and getting paid for it. And so, yeah, there there is... If you if you're not finding the joy in it, we've got to revisit that and find what's what's that motivation. What do you actually like about what you're offering as products and services? And at the end of the day, find the enjoyment exactly like you're saying. Um, let's talk about the difference, making a difference. You kind of touched on it. It's this idea of maybe advisory services and so forth. But let's talk about making a difference. What does that mean? Well, actually, just just one more thing on the enjoyment. Of yeah. course, is that. One of the reasons why they don't always enjoy it as well is because of the types of clients that they may have ended up working with. True, very true. Uh, sometimes we have those vampire clients that, you know, <laughs> we dread the phone call coming in and they, they suck the life out of you. So there are those aspects as well, actually, just, just working with a, a nicer kind of client uh, and just putting the marketing strategies in place to, to attract them. So I just wanted to finish on that. And again, uh, enjoyment extends to, to many, many aspects of running the business, doesn't it? It, it does. Well, you got a good point. Before you, you start into the difference, um, there are, you know, there's the 80-20 rule, obviously, where you've got those clients that maybe consume a lot of our time. But admittedly, there are instances where we unknowingly take on clients and we we just don't realize what that relationship is going to evolve into. We take on mm-hmm. individuals that are very needy sometimes. And uh, what we need to realize is we have to be a respecter of ourselves, our business, and sometimes realize that there may be a toxic relationship and best to let that person go to someone else that might be more conducive to their needs because there there is, this is a people business at the end of the day and we need to be able to have healthy relationships with our clients so i'm glad you touched on that point before we moved on so in terms of the making a difference and again that the, there's um multifold here as well so yes it is about delivering more ad advice solutions building those relationships up with uh, their clients delivering the advisory services. and But it's also about enabling those accountants to be able to, to make much more of a difference to their local and wider community. Um, you and I were introduced by a very good friend of mine, Steve Pipe. That's so right. So I suspect that you had a conversation with him about B1G1. Oh, yes. Very much uh, so. And, yeah, and that's something that's very close to my heart, and it's something that we certainly introduce those accountants to as well. So... In addition, you know, I think profits are a consequence of doing the right things for the right people, as the expression goes. And I can't remember who first coined that, uh, but it's absolutely true. And and linking with something like B one G one, where for you know you, you can you can create those impacts around the world based on the good things that you're doing for people as well, means that. There's a double whammy there. You know, you're making a difference to your clients. And as a consequence of that, you're making a difference around the world. Um, if, if you think about the the Maslow's um, you know, hierarchy, pyramid of needs. Of hierarchy of needs, you yes. know, we very quickly help people move through that. Uh, and they're just making a massive difference. And, um, yeah, you, you can't, it's very difficult, difficult to articulate what that feels like. It, it's just so much more powerful, isn't it? Um, So much more of a motivator. You know, the way I address it, and I think you're spot on, is I use the word purpose. Mm. When you have a business owner that's running a business, there will inevitably be days where things are hard, things are not going the way you planned or expected, and there's challenges. And when, when a person has purpose, and as we're describing it as making a difference, 
it enables us to kind of work through those challenging moments to get through to the other side because we have a reason for doing this. And that difference, that purpose can really be that catalyst to really help us get through those challenging times. And so as you brought up difference, I liked how you described it in two ways. At least this is how I was hearing it. It's first of all, making a difference for our clients. Are we doing more than just providing them the financial reports, helping them be compliant? Are we, are we doing more than just giving them information? Are we allowing them to use that information, helping them understand it in such a way that they're able to run their businesses much, be, much better, more informed, and in doing so, improve their situations? But the difference also then is what's referred to as our impact. What are you doing to give back to the community and make a difference? And you brought up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You're right. There comes a point at the pinnacle of that where we have self-actualization and we realize that we have a legacy. We have something to give back now. We can give, we can impart to our community a better world than what we started with and leave it better than we found it. And that's huge. And uh, I, I really think that B1G1, which is, is an excellent means to doing that, and uh, uh, I, I think a tool to help people that uh, want to make a difference do so. This is excellent. I mean, you're really addressing the two things that really, as businesses, we ought to consider. Are we helping our clients? Are we over-delivering on what we said we would do? And then are we actually helping improve the world in which we live? And so I like those two elements. Thank you for that. Hmm. So here's the next question. Uh, B1G1, uh, obviously the listeners may not have heard of this before. How would you describe that? B1G1 for me just makes it incredibly easy to make an impact around the world affecting the United Nations global goals, which may also be that your listeners aren't aren't familiar with as well. And I would recommend just Google the United Nations global goals. But the, the, um, you know, the, the, the quick fire version of that is that back in 2016, I think it was that the United Nations came together and defined 17 goals that would make the world a better place to live in. Um, uh, you know, overcoming poverty, uh, providing more education for people, equality, uh, and, and the list goes on. And um, B1G1 allows you to make even the smallest financial giving that will actually have a, a massive impact somewhere. So, for example, providing fresh water uh, to people, what B1G1 do is that they will they'll look at the cost of let's say installing a well in a village, and that might be a fairly large cost. But then they'll, they'll work out how how many years or how many days might this well be able to provide fresh water for, um, and for how many people, and they'll break that down then into tiny little impacts. So if you were to literally give half a, a US cent. Um, that might provide one person fresh water for a day. And so from your point of view, if you think, well, actually, you know, I'm not making a massive amount of profit now, but could I afford half a cent? Yes, I could. Then actually for for every one of those impacts, you're providing a person fresh water for a day. Um, and, And it just makes it incredibly easy. You know, they've got the apps, they've got the mechanisms, they can automatically be linked with um, accounting software and transactional software, those types of things as well. So you can automate it. Um, and really, you know, you, you can you can hold your head up proud and think, I am making a difference somewhere. Somewhere in the world, a child's got some fresh water thanks to this very small or very large giving or impact um, that I've just made. So for me, yeah, it just makes it very easy for you to um, positive positively impact something that's very close to your heart. And of all the global goals, something on there will likely resonate with you uh, and and just cause, you know, that that extra bump in your heart as you come across that when you think that's the one that I'd really like to be impacting here. You know, I like how you've described it because for me, I think it's basically the bridge that so many of us look for. Many people have within themselves the innate desire to help one another, to help someone else, particularly someone in need. And when you see suffering or you see people that have that inequity, you're, you're looking to see, well, can I make a difference? It's, I think it's very human to say that. Well, what B1G1 does is it does two things. One, it becomes the enabler. It's gone out, found, it's uh, validated or, or confirmed that the 
uh, organization, the association is in fact delivering on whatever that humanitarian need is. And so they're, they're kind of checking that out and validating it. So that's addressing one of the concerns that I think every individual has is if I was to donate, is it really getting to the person that I hoped it would? And then the second thing is it's the medium to actually then get those funds to that, that organization or to that need that exists that you're so interested in contributing to. And so it's that, it, that enabler, let's say, that all of a sudden it's the platform that I think so many of us look for is to, well, if I wanted to donate or contribute, how do I know that the money's going where I want it to and will make the impact that I expect that it will? Well, that's what these people do is B1G1 enables us to actually comfort, confidently and comfortably contribute and put the money where we feel it should be uh, placed based on our choices. And so uh, excellent thing. I'll put some information regarding that in the episode description and encourage everyone to go there to find out more about B1G1 and maybe how you could actually implement this in your own business and perhaps offer it to your clients as well. So let's let's go on to something that I heard you sh- you share with the whole idea of more enjoyment making a difference that I think is hugely important. And that's the fact that many accounting professionals, after offering quality accounting services for a period of time, typically get to a confidence confidence level where they feel they could do more with their clients than just provide the, the financial reports and help them be compliant. It's actually taking on more of an advisory role and maybe stepping into that CFO or coach type of, uh, position or relationship and perhaps even get paid for that next service. But oftentimes they don't know how to add that value in and incorporate it into the services they're offering. And sometimes it's also the confidence to really have the ability to offer the quality service effectively. I mean, it's one thing to have the desire to think I can make a difference, but how? How do you address that with the clients that you're working with? Um, yeah, it's a very good point, isn't it? Uh, wh- when we talk about advisory and, and certainly coaching business clients, there's a, there's an immediate assumption uh, on the on the part of the accountant that they have to know their client's business better than they do, mm-hmm. and that's absolutely not the case here, because what we're talking about with advisory is utilising the accountant's skills with numbers. And um, and delivering advisory around that. So, for example, uh, you know, on the most basic level, um, you know, accountants have got access to all of the numbers in a business, so much more than most business coaches will do as well. Um, and, and they can analyze those numbers, and there's software that helps to analyze those numbers as well. But they can they can just take elements of those numbers out and say, you know, if you were just to imp- in, improve this by even half a percent that would have a, a quite a significant impact on your bottom line, for example. Um, what are the ways that we could improve this? And maybe share some examples, certainly strategies that other business, when, when we're helping accountants, we give them lots of strategies that they can share with their clients on, on helping to change some of those numbers. Um, and so really it is, it's about using the natural skills that an accountant has with numbers to have those meaningful conversations with their clients. And, and for me, that's the type of advisory that accountants are most naturally suited to, to move into. It's not about knowing that. In fact, sorry if I sound like I'm moving off on a tangent now, but you know, I talk about coaching a lot. And, and for me, the, the best role of a coach is to ask the open questions, the questions in ignorance almost, uh, and just ask the daft questions. And you know, as an accountant, uh, you know, a natural tendency of an accountant is to want to have the answers, but actually, just being able to say to a, a, a you know a customer, a, a client, just to say, well, what do you think you could do to improve that just by half a percent, and just just start to trigger some ideas. They don't have to have the answers, and it's better that they don't. Uh, just say, just explain to me this process here. Why why are you doing it that way? What, if you if you could have a better way, what would that look like? And those types of questions are just really valuable to a business owner who's probably so busy that they've never stopped to take a look at their own process and think, actually, yeah, maybe there is a better way. You know, you're you're hitting it right on the head. The the idea here is, first of all, perspective. As the accounting professional, you have perspective that the business owner oftentimes lacks because they're so consumed by the day-to-day operations of their business. And so with that perspective, you have the numbers, also you have this bigger picture that allows you to come in and ask some very poignant questions that honestly may not be asked of the business owner by anyone else. And so we're in a position where we can ask questions that no one's asking. 
from a point of view that no one else has, and all of a sudden really make a difference. And you're right, there is a distinction between advisory and coaching services, but the thing that really makes a great coach is essentially two elements is how I describe it. It's first of all, asking the right questions. You mentioned it at the very beginning. The presumption is, is we're supposed to have all the answers. That's not true. Yeah. We're supposed to have the right questions. Mm -hmm. And they oftentimes have the answers or can get the answers because they are the experts in their own business. And so the first element of this is obviously asking the right questions. And then the second thing is the accountability. What we're bringing to the occasion, what they're really paying us for, in addition to those right questions, is the accountability that when they tell us they're going to do something, that it's a priority in their business, to then meet with us again and follow up and have them tell us whether or not they've actually done what they said they were going to do. That accountability is huge. And so when they're paying us to then work not just as their accounting professional, their bookkeeper, their tax preparer, but now work with them as their advisor, their coach, when we step into that capacity and we're paid for it, that's what they're paying for is asking the right questions, maybe even the hard questions, and then holding them accountable to what they say needs to be done next. So um, you brought up advisor and coach. How would you describe the two as being, you know, what's different about them? How would you define the, uh, the, the two different titles? I don't really, when we're helping our accountants, we're not really differentiating too much beyond that because we, we help them to do exactly what you just described there, hold them accountable. They're using those numbers to have those conversations. Yes, they're sharing a few strategies, but for me, sharing the strategies actually comes last. Asking those open questions as a starting point, how do you think you could improve on this? I kind of take people through a process. It's in one of my books, What's Next for Accountants, Mm -hmm. co coincidentally named after my name as well. So I call it the Lucas process, but it starts with, <laughs> you know, um, the, the L stands for learning. So learning about the situation, really seeking to understand, you know, about the current situation, the business, et cetera. Um, uh, and, uh, and digging deeper into that as well, you know, get into the, the underlying cause. So again, it's all through questions. Uh, the K stands for key perspective. So let's say a business owner has got a particular problem. It's really, um, key perspective stands for, you know, put yourself in the client's shoes or your customer's shoes or your team member's shoes. How do you think they're, you know, they, they're seeing this from their point of view? And, and this just gets people to open their minds a little bit to, to you know, as I say, the different perspectives. Um, and then uh, the A, in my case, stands for abracadabra. So in other words, if you could wave a magic wand, what would the outcome be? And again, these are just questions. Uh, and then there are actually two S's that follow this. So one is, you know, um, just coming up with the, the possible solutions and strategizing. Um, and then, um, well, that's it, possible solutions. And then the final one is the, the strategy. What, what's the action plan that we're going to put together? And then, as you quite rightly say, it really is about the accountability and having regular meetings like that. Uh, so for me, when I'm talking about advisory, it is about those kinds of conversations. I mean, there are many ways that accountants can add much more value, um, even, you know, management accounts, cash flow forecasting types of services where they're having meaningful conversations as well. You know, that explanation that you just gave there of those seven stages and, and points very, very helpful. I think those things are good. It's nice that you have an acronym that that is your name that you can use for that. That's that's <laughs> I think quite quite uh, uh, nice. The thing that I'd like to add though, with the advisory and coach that I've used for some time now, that I think has really helped people distinguish between the two roles, is advisor is generally someone that is educating. They're teaching concepts and principles. They're helping the client, the customer understand new things that they need to implement maybe in their business and so forth. The difference between the advisor and the coach, though, is the coach then is more at a one-to-one -one level where they're literally asking the specific questions of that situation and bringing the accountability to it. The advisor being more educational, more informative, the coach being more on the implementation side, asking the questions, holding them accountable. So if you're going to pay for an advisor, that's like bringing in an instructor, attending a class, going to someone that's an expert that can help kind of take you to that next level, but the coach is helping you implement it and holding you accountable for it. So kind of a, a distinction that I've been offering for years. Um, let's do this. Uh, you're in a situation where you're working with accountants like we are. Uh, what's the common thing that you think holds them back that they personally struggle with 
to then take these steps to move forward and improve their own businesses? Yeah, there's there's a number of, of things, really. I mean, uh, obviously, confidence is one of them. Uh, fearing that, um, you know, if they were to sit down with a client and ask these questions, that they, they have to have the answers, as I mentioned earlier. That's certainly one of them. Um, but also the fact that they've never, in many cases, positioned themselves as being that kind of advisor or coach. They've they've often, and maybe always, uh, positioned themselves as the compliance accountant. There's nothing wrong mm-hmm. with that. Obviously, compliance is, is very important to be delivering to clients. But if that's all they've ever been seen as in front of their clients, then to suddenly start having these conversations, they fear that the client will wonder, well, what's going off? You've never done this before. So these are the things, and they're more... Uh, self-limiting beliefs, mindset challenges that hold them back. Actually, the, the client, in reality, welcomes those kinds of conversations. Yes. It's just, it's just taking that first step and, and sitting down and having those conversations in the first place. Uh, and as I say, they really undervalue themselves. In many cases, actually, the accountants are giving lots of brilliant advice, but they're giving it away for free. And, and when you give it away for free you run the risk of it not being taken seriously. Uh, I, I have an expression, it's not mine, and I can't remember where I first heard it, but you know, the more they pay, the more they pay attention. Uh, and so actually sometimes just from a positioning point of view, just to, to be delivering this kind of service as a paid-for service, people take you more seriously, they'll listen to you, and, and they're much more prepared to take that action and report back to you, or, you know, in those accountability sessions. You know, I'm glad you brought that up. There, there's this balance that I see so many accounting professionals deal with, which is at one point, they're trying to add value to the services they're providing. They're trying to build better relationships with their clients, retain them longer. And from that, get referrals because of the extra uh, services or relationships that they have. But the thing is, is then there becomes this inequity. There's a lot of time and effort in that value. And at some point, we need to transition to charging for it and really getting uh, some revenue from all this extra work that we're doing. And so there is that balance, but I, I like how we've addressed it today. There's sometimes just fear, the fear of how and, and what to price and perhaps what to do. And I think we've been uh, kind of tapping on these things. The other thing that I like about what you brought up is the fact that there's a process to do all of this. There's a system to it. There's You don't have to reinvent this wheel. This has been done by many accounting professionals as they've likewise grown their business to the point of wanting to incorporate advisory services or coaching services. So this is really good. And um, what I'd want to ask now is what advice would you have for an accounting professional as they hear what we've been discussing and maybe considering moving into offering advisory services or working on their business? I think my main advice is for for those accountants to appreciate that they are, um, they they have the ability. Um, I I think that's one of the things that holds um, people back. As I say, I mean, for the past 24 years, I've, 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 I've helped over three and a half thousand accountants. And if there's one thing they have in common, it's it's the self-limiting beliefs on their own abilities. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yet we see this many times. So first of all, it is believing in themselves. And I know that's a bit of a cliche this time, uh, the, the, in this day and age, but actually it is about believing in themselves. Uh, and just having those conversations with clients, just asking them the thought-provoking questions, exploring what does what do their clients really want to achieve? What are their goals? Um, there's, there's nothing more, more, I don't think important right now than just having those meaningful conversations with clients and just really connecting with them on that level, having those types of conversations. We we no longer, there's these old expressions in there about, oh, you know, I'm a B2B type of business or I'm a B2C, business to business, business consumer. And, And I firmly believe that no, we're in H to H. It is human to human. And that's about the relationships that we have. And, and the rest actually just, it comes from those types of conversations. Um, it's about taking a genuine interest. And I, and I think, you know, once you start to take that genuine interest and ask those questions, then it just opens your client's eyes to 
uh, I'm not wording this very well, but you know, the, the client starts to talk about what they want, and actually the accountant can start to spot opportunities on how they could help them more anyway. It kind of naturally flows. Yeah, what what I like about where you've gone with this is the H to H, the human to human. This is a people business at the end of the day. I think too often we presume that it's the numbers that we're offering. And really mm-hmm. what it is is we're we're meant to become, in my opinion, trusted strategic advisors, trusted in the sense that it's a safe zone for our clients to comfortably speak to us about challenges and concerns that they have. And at the end of the day, see our relationship one as a coach where we're able to help them think through and process some of the things that they're dealing with and look at them from a different perspective than they're experiencing them because we have so many of the numbers that we can bring to the equation and help them maybe forecast and plan better with what it is they're dealing. So this is this is a great conversation. So here's what I'd like to do. One, I'd like to obviously kind of summarize our conversation today, but Shane, I'd, I'd like to then come back to you for a closing thought. And as I recap all this, I do want to point out that in the episode description, I'm going to be putting quite a bit of information there that you can access as the listener. I not only mentioned earlier the B1G1 that I'll be putting in there, but uh, the... Uh, books that Shane's mentioned. I'll put some information about those. And then I'll also make mention of two offers that I want you to take advantage of. There is a book. It's one that I feel all accounting professionals should have. It's literally meant to help you put profit first. And it's essentially nine principles to make your business profitable. It's called In the Black. It is a free copy of the book for you. It's a book that every accounting professional should have in their library. It's essentially meant to help you run your business more effectively and profitably, but also these principles can be applied with your clients. So I encourage you to go there and get a copy of the ebook in the black, Nine Principles to Make Your Business Profitable. Likewise, I'll be putting some information regarding becoming a profit and growth expert. It's exactly what we've been discussing today that Uh, What Shane's describing really comes down to two key elements. It's confidence and competence to be able to work with your clients with your head held high, seeing them as peers, you being a business owner, they being a business owner, but then competently taking care of their needs as it comes to compliance, bookkeeping, accounting, but also perhaps moving into that role as being an advisor and or coach. So um, as a summary of my uh, kind of takeaways from this conversation is Shane has done a number of things over the last number of years to really address what I think a lot of accountants experience. And it's, first of all, what we were talking about at the beginning, the fear. It's the fear of the unknown, the uncertainty. And really, when you have a process that you can follow and actually put into um, practice, let's say, these things, you can literally take your business to a whole new level with not only being more profitable, but definitely working less with a lot less effort, concern, definitely a lot more enjoyment, and last of all, making a difference. That for your clients, but also perhaps even giving back to the community. So I think we touched on some very important elements that everyone needs to be considering as they're running their business. But the other thing that I really liked about this discussion today is the fact that we did get into not just compliance work and providing the financials, but we also addressed some of the things related to advisory work. There is such a need and demand out there for our clients to have access to someone like an accounting professional that is willing to ask the tough questions, ask the right questions, and in the end, perhaps even hold them accountable so that there is some responsibility that uh, they may be not experiencing in their business, but now have with the services that we're providing. So lots of great information. Shane was a wealth of information here today. I'm grateful that he was on the show because we as accounting professionals need to consider this as we're working on our business. Now, with that being said, Shane, what do you have as a final closing thought for us? You know, I'd just like to say, if if what we've talked about here does resonate with you, then um, I'm also going to give you a link, Roger, to pop into this podcast notes as well to to get a free Mm -hmm. copy of my latest book as well, which is putting excellence into your practice. Uh, And that really does take you through a seven-stage process. We've not talked about that seven-stage process, actually, in this uh, session, but a seven-stage process that's proven time and again to help accountants really transition their practice we call it practice over here. You you refer to firm, but your accounting firm um, into something that is much more profitable and enjoyable. Uh, that's that's allowing you to make a profound difference because you know that's what accountants do. They make a profound difference to the people that they work with. 
You know, Shane, thank you for that. I would love to put that in there, and I appreciate extending that offer to them. Uh, let me do this then. I'm going to just basically wrap this up. Uh, I am your host, Roger Connect, president of Universal Accounting Center. For more than 20 years, I've been working with accounting professionals to also help build the premier accounting firm in your area. And with these tips and tricks each and every week, I encourage you to subscribe to the podcast and listen to our other episodes and see what gems of information you can have access to as to what you can be doing in your business today as you're actually trying to offer the quality accounting services that you do and obviously get paid well for what it is you offer. For more information on these principles and how you can apply them in your business or for more information on how you can actually train your staff and offer these quality services, Check us out. Go to universalaccountingschool.com or give us a phone call. You can reach us at 801-265-3777. And in the end, always remember this. If it's about accounting, it is universal. Take care and have a great day.